Greetings to you all. Greetings to all of you that are online on Zoom. As James so well said, we're glad that our unity is in our hearts to our Lord Jesus. Not where we physically are, we're all together in one mind and one spirit in the Lord. We're going to continue our study in 1 Peter. Remembering that the great pressure, privilege we have. Remember in chapter 2, verse 9 of 1 Peter. He says, you are an elect race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for, all, for God's own possession, that you may show forth the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Who were in times past were no people, but now are the people of God. We are the people of God. There could be no position that could even begin to compare with what God's given us. And as we talked last week, or last time I spoke, not last week, Mike spoke last week. This great privilege that God has given us brings out a necessity to walk in the steps of Jesus, to be just like Jesus, and that brings duties to us. What we talked about the last time is in, we're in 1 Peter 2, verse 11 and 12, where he said, I beseech you, as sojourners and pilgrims, to abstain from fleshly lusts which war against your soul. Having your behavior seemly amongst the Gentiles, that whereas they speak of you as evildoers, they may by your good works which they behold, glorify God in the day of visitation. Now today he'll go on to talk about our second duty, as Peter mentions it here. That'll be in verses 13, our duty to submit to civil, civil rulers. He'll say, be in subjection to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake whether as kings as supreme or governors as sent by them to render vengeance to those that do evil and praise to those that do good. For so is the will of God that you by your good, your well works will put to e silence the ignorance of foolish men as free, yet not using your freedom as a cloak of wickedness, but as Bond servants of God, honor all men, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the king. The necessity of Christians and saints to walk according to this, the, the steps of Jesus to glorify God amongst the worldly people that are around us who are in darkness, we have to show obedience. Not rebellion like the world does. The world sees man's ordinances. The world sees man's uh, commandments. And they don't like them. They don't do them. Christians obey. Christians are the light of the world. They show the world how people ought to live. God is the one that designated those people. God set those people up. All these rulers, God set them up according to his sovereignty, his omniscience, and his omnipotence. And sometimes we don't understand the people that God put in these, these places. We just had a, an election year. And we might not all be pleased with the way things are coming out. But what we have to know is that whoever is on that throne, God put him there. And God has a purpose for everything he does. God does everything perfect. He makes no mistakes. And if we don't understand it, get back in the book and get on your knees in prayer. Because God put that man there and God knows what he's doing. We need to understand 
and know and obey the people that God gives the authority to rule. So he says, be in subjection to every, every ordinance of man. Be in subjection. That means to line up under their authority. The word means to subordinate yourself. It's a word that you line up just like a, 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 a army formation lines up under a supreme person that has power over them. He says you line up under these rulers. And that is not Peter's only, not only Peter's decision. Paul tells us the same thing in, in Romans 13. Verses 1 and 2, Paul says, So let every soul be in subjection to the higher powers. For there is no power that's not of God, and the powers that be are ordained by God. Therefore, he that resists the power withstandeth the ordinance of God. And he that withstandeth will receive judgment unto himself. These are ordinances put out by men, but they're put out by men to whom God has given the authority to do that. And he says, for the Lord's sake, it's not for any human motives. It's not because you're afraid of a punishment. It's for the glory of God that we do these things. It is unto him that we give ourselves. There is no power but of God. If that God is a if that man is a wicked ruler, he'll answer to God. That's not our business. Our business is to be obedient, to show the people around us the life that should be lived in all law keeping, in all the things that people that are saints of Christ, will show the world, whether as to the king, as supreme. Now when Peter wrote this, Nero was the emperor, an evil tyrant leader. He was the emperor when Paul wrote Romans also. And they're telling us that you obey these wicked rulers. You put yourselves under there. You subject yourselves to them. You subordinate yourselves to them. Christians are to obey these men in everything they say except where it violates what God said. As Peter and John stands before the Sanhedrin, who is commanding them, you don't speak in his name anymore. We're in Acts 4. In verse 19, Peter and John answers, whether it's right in the sight of you to obey you rather than God, judge you. For we cannot but speak the things which we heard in Saul. They turn them loose. Nothing to, nothing to, to uh, accuse them for. They turn them loose. They go right back into the temple again and preach the same Christ, the resurrected Christ, which these rulers crucified. They grab them again and bring them back in there, and they threaten them some more. And they said, 529, we must obey God rather than man. What's that cost them? If you go down to verse 40 and 41, they got beaten for it and cast out. And they left there with bloody backs, rejoicing and praising the Lord that they were found worthy to suffer for the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. They were obedient in everything except for it violated what God said. Jesus John 19 stands before Pilate. Pilate who has said over and over again, I find no guilt in this man. He knew Jesus was innocent. But he's going to make a pitifully poor decision. But as he stands before, as Jesus stands before Pilate, and Pilate says, answer you me nothing? 
He says, do you not know, or in verse 10, do you not know that I have power to release you or power to crucify you? And what Jesus answered, you would have no power over me at all, except it were not given you from above. Jesus recognized in the face of the cross and yields himself to the decision of Pilate. You would have no power over me except God didn't give it to you. God gave Pilate the authority and the power to make the decision to release Jesus or crucify him. We know what decision he made. But Jesus yielded to that decision. Because Jesus said in Matthew, I could call 12 legions of angels and it wiped this whole mess out. Jesus didn't have to subject himself to that. But he did. And he gives us an example that you yield to the rulers that are over you. Whether the king, we just said, whether a king is supreme, or in verse the next verse, or governors who are sent by him, by that king, by the emperor, or by the senate of the Roman Empire, who are sent by him for vengeance against the evil, and praise for them that do good. Here again, Paul and him agree perfectly because they're, they're, in, they're inspired of the same God. But he goes on in verse 3 of Romans 13. says, For a ruler is not a terror to them that do good, but to the evil. And if you would not fear the power, do that which is good, and you'll receive praise of the same. For he is a minister of God. Listen to him. He is a minister of God for your good. But if you do that which is evil, be afraid. Because he does not bear the sword in vain. But he is a minister of God, an avenger for wrath against them that do evil. He is a minister of God. Whoever God puts on the throne as president or king a ruler or tyrant, God put him there. God makes no mistakes. What he does, he does for a purpose, for the good of his kingdom and the salvation of souls. The rest is unimportant. Salvation of souls who got to live, who have to live eternally in one of two places. And if that requires wicked rulers, God's going to put them on the throne. And when he puts those wicked rulers on the throne, we as Christians are obligated to obey those, those laws. Whether we like them or not is immaterial. Has nothing to do, it, do with it. He says by governors, Pilate was the governor we're talking about who Jesus was before. Peter and John stood before the Sanhedrin. Where'd they get their power? God gave it to them to persecute his people. Who did Paul stand before? Felix, Festus, where'd they come from? The governors that we're talking about right here. And they yielded to those people. Paul even said, if I'm guilty of death, I refuse not to die. These people all believed in capital punishment. We make a mockery out of it by failing to obey God. God says there are certain people that don't deserve to live. They're to be put to death. By obeying the laws. He says these people are sent by him. We know that God has all the power. It's God. That changes the times and the seasons, sets up kings and takes down kings. Gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to those that have understanding. But God gives men that power to make those decisions. They don't always make the right decisions. God 
gave them the authority and the power to make the decision. Just like he gives each one of us the authority to make our decision. God gives us the right to choice. We are free to make the choice. We're not free from the result that will follow the choice. Those leaders. What do you think Pilate felt when he faced the Lord when he left this earth? He knew he made the wrong decision. Our leaders today often make the wrong decisions. But that's between them and God, and they'll pay for that decision before the Almighty God, and that's not of our business. Our business is to obey them in everything that they don't violate what God said to do. It's our duty to show the world what righteous people do. It's our duty. What did he say in verse 12 that we read a while ago? Having your behavior seemly amongst the Gentiles, amongst all these heathens that don't believe in Christ. Have your behavior seemly, that whereas they speak of you as evildoers, they may by your good works, which they behold, glorify God in the day of visitation. That's why we do these things. It's for God's sake. It's for God's kingdom's sake that we do these things. Any law is better than anarchy. Sorry laws are better than anarchy. We have a bunch of anarchy that's been going on. In different titles, they call them communist organizations, socialist organizations that are total anarchist organizations. They're defying the law. They're doing exactly what Peter and Paul says Christians don't do. We don't have the right to rebel. We have the right to obey to God's glory and honor. For so is the will of God. This is the will of God. And I know that our nature... And I'm no different than you all. When they have put out laws I don't like, I don't want to get under that law. God said, do it. You do it to God's glory. Not, it's not for us, as I said before. It's not for anything except it's God's will. We don't have to know anything else. When God puts a ruler on the throne... What, for what reason God put him there? We don't need to know that. We just need to know that God did it. And when he's on there, he's there because God wants him to be there. For so it's the will of God that by well-doing, you put to silence the ignorance of foolish men. It's done by showing ourselves in the face of all this darkness around us. Christians glorify God no matter what. Penny's going through a bunch of old junk we have. You know, all those old papers that you keep forever that are, are useless. And she came across a writing by Calvin Coolidge. He was our 30th president. He was president from 1923 to 1929. That's even before my time. <laughs> hundred years ago. And I want us to read what was on that little thing. Listen to what Calvin Coolidge said a hundred years ago. <laughs> We do not need more national development. We need more spiritual development. We do not need more intellectual power. We need moral power. We do not need more knowledge. We need more character. We do not need more government. We need more religion. All of our learning in science, our culture, our arts will be of little avail unless they're supported by high character. Unless there be honor and truth and justice, unless our material resources are supported by moral and spiritual resources, there is no foundation for progress. 
Hmm. A trained intelligence can do much, but there is no substitute for morality, character, and religious convictions. Unless these abide, American citizens will be found unequal to the task. Great statement, huh? We're now reaping results of refusing to do what Calvin Coolidge told us a hundred years ago. We are in the midst of God's judgment. We are to put to silence the ignorance of foolish man. The word silence there comes a word means to gag them, muzzle them, make them silence. The silence of the ignorance, silence the ignorance of foolish men. The word foolish there means mindless. The Strong's lexicon says it means stupid. That's a pretty strong word, isn't it? Stupid. Ignorant. Egotistic. Rash and unbelieving, he says. We are to put to silence the ignorance of these foolish men. And we don't do that with anger and rebellion and vengeance. We do that by well-doing. And that's often against our nature because Satan likes to use our physical nature, our natural instincts, our rebellion against these foolish, stupid people. But God says that's not the way Christians do it. And if we really think about it, and you consider their end, they are people that are to be pitied. Can you imagine the terror and the wrath that will be in their hearts when they face God? In their ignorance of the foolish men? Consider their end. Remember what he said in verse 12. Having your behavior seemly amongst the Gentiles, that whereas they speak against you as evildoers, they may by your good works glorify God in the day of visitation. That's what we're living here for, brethren. To show this world how we live seemly amongst the Gentiles. That's amongst the heathens, the non-believers. For the purpose of what? So they can see our good works and glorify God. Our Father in the day of visitation. We can't do that by being angry and rebellious. We can only do that by being obedient and showing the world how Christians live. We walk in the steps of Jesus. Jesus put that pattern out there. He says you walk in him. Jesus spoke to the same problem, a passage that you all can quote. In the Sermon on the Mount, ye are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither does a man light a candle and place it under a bushel, but on a stand, and it shines unto all that are in the house. Even so, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. Paul makes the same statement Philip in, uh, in uh, Philippians 2. In a verse, starting in verse 12. So then, brethren, even if you always obeyed, not only my presence, much more my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it's God that works in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Do all things without murmuring and question. That you may be children of God without blemish, without any type of misconduct. Children of God without blemish, without any of these evil things that we're talking about. For what reason? That you may show forth his light, he says. 
Show forth the light amongst the myth of a crooked and perverse generation among whom you are seen as lights in the world, holding forth the word of life. That's what we're doing. We need to leave these people with nothing that they can say against us that is honest. The only charge they can give us is faith. To make us criminals, they have to do like Roman did and outlaw Christianity. So the only charge they can give against us is our faith. I think I said last time I spoke a statement that Tertullian said. He was one of the church fathers. Lived in, I think he was born in 155 A.D. He said... There were no Christians in prison for crime, but only for faith. Paul going to Jerusalem. Everybody is telling him, don't go to Jerusalem. Paul tells him in verse tw- chapter 20, verse, verse 24, we're in Acts. He says, I hold not my life of any account of dear unto myself that I might accomplish my course, the ministry which I received from my Lord Jesus to proclaim the gospel of the grace of God. He said, I'm going to proclaim the good news of the grace of God. They keep threatening him, telling him, don't go, don't go. He says in chapter 21, 13, what do you weeping and breaking my heart? I am ready Not only to be bound in Jerusalem, but to die for the name of my Lord Jesus. He knew what God told us to do. By well deep doing, we muzzle and stop the mouths of them till they have nothing to say. They are ignorant, foolish men. If you're not in Christ, let me tell you clearly, bluntly, you're ignorant and foolish. Anything outside of Christ is ignorant and foolish. And we're here to show them what they should be living like. These people are ignorant people. They're the people that Paul spoke of in 1 Corinthians 2 verse 14. He says, For the natural man cannot receive the things of the Spirit of God for their foolishness to him. And they can't know them because they're spiritually judged. Remember verse 12. We do all these things that they might glorify God in the day of visitation. Our life is to draw people out of this dark world into Christ. But if they refuse, if we live the right lives, they'll have no excuse on the judgment day. They will have to pay. They will be down on their knees confessing Jesus as Lord to the glory of God the Father as they're sliding into the lake of fire and brimstone. But make sure that our life was such that should have turned them around. If they refuse, that's between them and God. He says, as free yet not holding your freedom as a cloak of wickedness, but as bondservants to God. We're free. Galatians 5.1, For freedom in Christ sets you free. Stand fast, therefore, and be not encountered in, encumbered with a yoke of bondage. But he goes down in verse 13, that same chapter, says the same thing Paul uh, Peter says right here. He says, For ye, brethren, were called for freedom. Only use not your freedom as a occasion of the flesh, but by love, serving one another. Paul says the same thing that Peter says. You don't make a cloak of wickedness. The cloak is a rarely used word which is translated veil in a lot of places. It's a pretense to cover up the wicked we're doing. You don't use your freedom 
as a cloak of righteousness. We have freedom in Christ. If you walk in the light as he is in light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Christ, his Son, cleanses us of all sins, 1 John 1, 7. There is therefore now no condemnation to those that are in Christ Jesus, for the law of the Spirit of life in Christ made you free from the law of sin and death. We're not even under the law that says you can, that you, when you sin, you die. Jesus, we're hidden in Jesus. He paid for all of our sins. But that does not give us a quota of sin. That gives us no right to sin. Now we know we stumble and fall, and because of that, the grace of God takes care of it. But some people want to do the things they want to do and hmm, get to it, make excuses for themselves by saying, well, that's just my nature. Well, get rid of it. You don't have the right to have that nature. God says, you get rid of all that sin. Paul writing, and he tells us how the Jews reacted to the, to, the, to the preaching of grace. They thought they could be righteous by what they did by themselves. So Paul says in verse, he ends up uh, the, the chapter 5 in Romans, verse 19. He says, as through one man's sin... The many were made, excuse me, for one man's disobedience, the many were made sinful. And by one man's obedience, the many were made righteous. And the law came in besides that the trespass might abound, and where sin abounded, grace did abound more exceedingly. That as the sin reigned in death, even so might righteousness reign through, through uh, might grace might reign through righteousness in the Lord through eternal life in the Lord Jesus Christ. And what was the Jews' reaction to that? <laughs> that is sin then, that grace may abound. What did Paul say? God forbid you who died to sin, how can you any longer live therein? Are you ignorant that as many were baptized into Christ, baptized into his death, dead men don't sin. You are buried therefore with him in baptism unto death, that like as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, you also should walk a newness of life. For if you are united with him in the light of his death, you should be also in the righteousness of his resurrection, knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him. That the body of sin be done away with, be no longer in bondage to sin. For he that's died is justified. If we died with Christ, we believe we'll live with Christ. Christ, being raised from the dead, dieth no more. Death no more hath dominion over him. The death that he died unto sin, the life he lives, is lives unto God. Even so, verse 11. Even so. Consider yourself as dead unto sin and alive unto God through Jesus Christ. We don't use our freedom for wickedness. But as bondservants of God, remember our context. Be subject to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake. Subject to the Lord. Paul also says in Romans 6, in verse 16, he says, Know ye not that to whom you present yourselves as servants, his servants you are whom you obey. Whether of sin and to death, or obedience unto righteousness. But thanks be to God that whereas you were servants of sin, you became obedient from the heart to that form of teaching whereunto you were delivered, and having been made free from sin, you become obedient, you become servants of righteousness. Everybody in this world is nothing but a servant. And we're either a servant of sin or we're a servant of righteousness. And those two determined where we spend our eternity. 
under all men. I'm jumping over a slew of stuff I had prepared. Under all men. All men are created in the image of God. Wicked, good, whatever they are. They're created in the image of God. Jesus thought that all men was worthy of him to die on the cross for. Love the brotherhood. Let love be without hypocrisy. Abhor that which is evil. Cleave to that which is good. In love of the brethren, be ye tenderly affected one towards another. That's Romans 12, 9, and 10. Fear God. Proverbs 1, 7, 9, 10, 23, 17, Psalms 111, 10. All 11 says, the fear of Jehovah is the beginning of knowledge, the beginning of wisdom. Honor the king. That king was Nero. Whoever God puts there, do it. Obey him. Part of God's judgment on wicked people is giving them wicked rulers. Look at the history of Israel and Judah. Where did Jeremiah, the Jeroboams come from? Where did the Ahabs and the Ahazes and the, and the Manassehs come from? God put them on that throne as king. Evil, wicked men. For what reason? Because the people were evil. You can't get more evil than the United States today. You can't. When we honor and make laws to uphold and honor and call good that which God says is an abomination and we were murdering off thousands and thousands we, we, we talk about the, we're worried about the COVID and it doesn't even begin to compare with the death we're putting to death we're murdering those babies and you think God is not going to judge us for that and he's going to give us wicked rulers and we need to understand what God's doing so that we can join God in His work. How are we doing? Are we living like this tells us in obedience to the laws around us so people can see how we ought to be living? Are you walking in your ignorance as a foolish man outside of Christ? If you are, make it right. Come to Christ. But when you come to Christ, you repent. That means you change your mind. You're no longer going to live like the world lives. You're going to live like God wants you to live. You're going to be, by your well-doing, you're going to put to silence the ignorance of foolish men. Come to Jesus. Whatever you need to do, come to Jesus today. Don't be that ignorant, foolish person that's outside of Christ. We're going to stand and sing. If you need anything, make it right.